I'm Ed Ravy, otherwise known as the Rabbit Atheist, a former pastor turned atheist, now a compassionate anti-theist. Welcome to my channel. Feel free to like or dislike the video, so feel free to hit those buttons. Feel free to comment below, <clears throat> and I would appreciate it if you would uh, subscribe to the channel and hit your notification bell for more content as it is released. The, uh, you're also free to share my videos as much as you like, because this purpose of this channel is, of course, educational. Um, I'm starting a little bit of a new series here uh, in response to some of the thoughts of uh, at least one commenter, but also some comments I got off channel and away from the comment section, talking about Bible contradictions. Um, I've always considered Bible contradictions a little bit of a low-hanging fruit for somebody like me, but I get why that is so, uh, why people are interested in it, because uh, for a Christian, the reason they're interested in Bible contradictions is they don't believe they exist, so they try to figure out ways to explain them away. For those of us that are skeptics, we simply point out that Bible contradictions are something uh, that, you know, demonstrate quite ably, in fact, that the Bible cannot be inspired and it certainly cannot be inherent. And once you get rid of the Bible, the New Testament Bible and the Old Testament Bible, the 66 book in the Protestant Bible and the many more in the uh, Catholic Bible, uh, once you get rid of all that, what you discover is that uh, it's not infallible and therefore inherent, not inherent. And as such, everything you believe about God, Jesus, everything is, is subject to scrutiny. This is one of the reasons why um, so many people push the idea of, uh, you know, trying to solve Bible contradictions. Um, recently, several apologists have published books on Bible contradictions, and I look through the list of the contradictions that they're dealing with. And most of the time, I'm like, man, these are softballs. They don't really deal with the big ones. In fact, uh, today I want to talk about the great contradiction. And what I think stems from the entire problem, the reason why the entire problem exists is because of this great contradiction. And it's a philosophical one and a psychological one. And that is when you sit down and talk with most Christians and you ask them about what their idea about God is, and they start to describe God, is the great contradiction that often exists is the God that they are describing does not line up with the God of the Bible. And that's something that they don't really want to accept or don't even really think about. I used to think about it all the time, which is why my theology was constantly being adjusted. Because I was trying to find a theological view of God that didn't con that I would could have that made a lot of sense that also didn't conflict with the Bible. This becomes the great contradiction because there's really no way to do it. The God of the Bible is is problematic for a lot of reasons, mostly because he's concocted by at least 40 men, if not more, putting together these various things. And many of them are separated by centuries of time. And because of that, their viewpoints of God, even within the pages of scripture, are different. And when you try to reconcile those differences of opinion, what you end up with mostly is an impossible case. But the contradiction really is not so much that the Bible in its books contradicts itself. To me, the great problem is the difference between my God and the biblical God. The my God and the biblical God are two very different creatures. Uh, if you talk to most Christians, my God is loving, caring. Uh, he looks out for us. He brings about justice in the world. He does this, that, and the other. He answers our prayers. He's a real good guy. He sent Jesus to die for our sins and so on and so forth. The real issue that I have with said God is many of the times I hear such claims being made about God. And I think to myself, have you read your Bible? Because there seems to be a few biblical verses that kind of contradict the idea of God being loving, for instance, uh, or being just. I think the the biggest knock that I took as I studied the Bible is trying to get a standard of justice that God was consistent with. And my idea of justice was that people truly, genuinely got what they deserved. Now, as an atheist, I now believe that nobody ever really gets what they deserve. 
as far as justice. There's plenty of people that get away with a lot of things and they will never face justice for it, not on this planet. And there are many other people that are unjustly persecuted and never get justice for that. I mean, justice is one of those things that we all have a sense of. Uh, we could probably argue about the details, but we all have that notion of what it is. Well, God of the Bible, you know, doesn't follow those rules, whereas the my God, the God that most Christians have in their head or most believers have in their head, is a just God. But you run into the problems of saying, okay, I believe God is just, for instance, and then trying to find where God is always just in the Bible, okay? Uh, one of the things, you know, is the genocides. Why does God want to kill all those people? Well, he just doesn't like them. Well, they were evil, based on whose criteria? What just criteria are we using here? Well, God said so. Oh, so God, based on an argument from authority and his authority, because he can't point to a standard of justice that is universal that he even adheres to, just gets to tout authority and gets to go kill people. See, this is the problem, isn't it? See, if you're a believer right now and you're watching this video, I want you to understand the mental gymnastics that you have to go through every day to believe in the God of the Bible being the God that you think is your God. Because the God that you believe in is loving, kind, just, answers prayers, does things for you, looks out for you. The God of the Bible on several occasions definitely says, oh, to hell with that, and comes after his people on occasion. Oh, but he's just disciplining them. Killing people is not discipline. Killing people is murdering them. They're done. They're finished. There's no way for them to repent when you kill thousands of people because they made some sort of disobedient act, then there's no way for them to repent or say, oh yeah. And it kind of undercuts this notion that some of you have of my God is all knowing. If he's all knowing, then he would know what every believer, what every unbeliever in particular would need to know to believe. And if he's truly loving, then he would want everybody to go to heaven. He doesn't, shouldn't want anybody to go to hell if he's a just and loving and caring God. And yet people go to hell. You don't have to violate my free will and make me a believer. What you simply have to do is show and demonstrate to me and everybody else that doesn't believe what it is that would make them believe. And God being God, according to your God, your my God that you have in your head, should be able to know what every single unbeliever needs to know in order to be saved. And yet, God doesn't bring that about. Either your my God isn't as loving as you claim to be, or he doesn't exist. And if you try to reconcile that God with the God of the Bible, who basically says, yeah, I separate the sheep and the goats. I'm going to save one and kill the other. <clears throat> I mean, the reason Calvinism exists is there are some good verses of the Bible that kind of indicate that God just chooses who's going to hell and who's going to heaven. That's a very arbitrary decision. That's not a decision based on merit. It's not a decision based on anything other than, well, they didn't believe in me. You know, there. I was thinking about this this week. Wouldn't it be nice if the standard for getting into heaven was actually contributing something to the planet? Like uh, being a part of a team that, you know, you get salvation if you do good stuff, if you stop wars. If you, you know, this is how you gain salvation. Now, some people do believe that that's how you do it. But when you offer up as a Protestant would this idea of just grace, then anybody can get in. The most notorious murderer that ever existed can bow his knee and say, God, forgive me, save me from my sins, and he gets to go to heaven. And the person that is the greatest philanthropist, never heard a fly, but simply doesn't believe in God, gets to go to hell purely on faith. Well, that's not what faith is about. Ah, but that's the difference, isn't it? That's the great contradiction. The great contradiction is you have this idea of a loving, caring God that loves everybody and cares for everybody and wants everybody to go to heaven. And yet he creates a plan in which that is not possible. 
he deliberately stacks the deck against people getting saved. He knows what would convince me, for instance, of his existence and of his love for me, and yet he keeps it to himself. I mean, from all descriptions, hell is a pretty rotten place. Even if you believe in purgatory and then everybody goes to heaven, that's still a pretty rotten deal. It seems to me that God being a loving, caring God and knowing what I would need to know in order to accept him would present that to me as quickly as possible because he doesn't want me to go to hell. Now, apparently we have to sit there and say, uh, for instance, I used to hear the phrase and used to use it. Well, God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. Everybody just chooses hell. Really, do they? When you consider the omnipotent, omniscient, all-loving nature of God, do they really choose? You don't have to violate somebody's free bill to give them convincing evidence. If you know, because you're God, what this brain will accept as a belief and understanding of God, then all you have to do as God is present that evidence, present what that takes, and that person will repent. That's all you have to do. You don't have to violate their free will. You just have to know what it is that would convince them. And being God, he does know. And yet he chooses not to use it. And many people go to their graves, believing in nothing, having no understanding of God or whatever. And that's the real contradiction, isn't it? Because you have this theological view of God that you think is from the Bible but it's not from the Bible. It's your own concoction of what you think the perfect God would be. You have created an image of your own making in your own head. You see, I suddenly realized many years ago, uh, about three or four years before I left the ministry, that when I was praying, I was talking to myself, that the God I was talking to was something that I had created up here. Oh, I had studied the Bible. I had tried to lift some ideas from God from those pages. But the more I studied the Bible, the more I realized there was no way to reconcile a real, just, compassionate, all-powerful, all-knowing God with the pages of Scripture. It became a great, the great contradiction in my brain. When we talk about Bible contradictions, the biggest one that you have to get over really is the one of the Bible that you created contradicts with the Bible in the pages of Scripture. Because the Bible in the pages of Scripture, as he is revealed by the Scripture, is not what you think he is. Jesus is not the Jesus you think he is. I used to run into that all the time with Jesus. Um, people, well, Jesus would never hurt a fly. Hmm. There's even a prophecy that says he won't. He won't bruise a reed or a rat or a flax or anything. That's interesting, because didn't Jesus overthrow tables? Didn't he use a surge of money cords on, of cords on the money changers? Didn't he upset everybody in a place of business because he felt it was wrong? What, do you, you, you think he was just waving that cat of nine hails around in the air? That's a violent act. And the idea that, oh, Jesus wouldn't hurt a fly, this is not put up by the scripture. What you I deal with constantly when it comes to contradictions, and we have to understand this mindset as we go forward dealing with biblical contradictions, is that the great contradiction is what we think the God should be, and then we look at the Bible and we discover, huh, he doesn't meet any of our expectations. In fact, the God of the Bible is contradictory within himself. And that becomes a real problem because what people are looking for is something to believe in. And the problem is they're believing in something that is not logically possible, nor is it reality. It's not truth. And this is what becomes the great contradiction that everybody has to overcome. See, I have to talk about this because even if you're a non-believer or you just come out of faith, one of the great challenges you have in deconversion, and I've had this challenge, is I still had certain notions that somebody was going to make it right. I still had certain notions that somebody out there loved me. I still had certain notions that somebody was always watching. All three of those things are now no longer true. I know that as much as I try to achieve justice, 
by following the noble virtue, the, the higher virtue of justice, sometimes it just won't get achieved. There are people in this world that I know have done dirt and they will never face consequences from it or it's very slight that they'll face consequences for it. You know, I that somebody is always watching me. That's not true. There are literally things that I do that nobody else knows about because I'm by myself. And nobody ever will know unless I tell them what I was doing. Same is true for people around me. There are certain things that people do that I will never know. The only things I really know about people are the things that I do together or the things I observe. But the reality is nobody's really watching you. You know, unless you have a government that's overbearing watching every move you do, then yeah, maybe you do have a problem with somebody watching you. But even then, there are always places where people are unobserved. You can't watch everything and you can't watch all the time. See, it's those notions that kind of say, oh, well, I'll let it go because, you know, somebody will make it right. Who's somebody? See, I'm bringing about this as to those of you who have deconverted as a deconversion issue because you still have some attitudes. I still have some attitudes that come down to the contradiction in my head of what I think is right because there should be this all-powerful, all-knowing, loving God, even though I think it's nonsense. I still think that way in how I approach issues. Oh, well, I can't really deal with that issue. Somebody will bring justice to it. I'm not really watching what's going on over there. Maybe I don't need to know. But also, you know, people have the right to be private and do the private thing, and that's okay. And if you have to have somebody watching you all the time to behave, then I would say that you have a problem with your behavior, that you're not really all that moral. Good morality, good following of virtue, is when nobody's watching and you still do the right thing. And that's true whether you believe or not. Nobody's watching you. Are you still going to do the right thing? Nobody will ever observe. Nobody will ever tattletale on what you did. You will have situations like that as a non-believer. Are you still going to do the right thing because it's simply the right human thing to do? I think you should. So here's the issue, isn't it? As we look at contradictions, because the next video I'm going to deal with is, is we're going to have to talk about what constitutes a contradiction. But the first contradiction that I have to deal with is this great one. The contradiction between what's in the Bible, really and genuinely in the Bible about God, and our own my God, or the God that I think about. When I use my God, it's a very broad term. Even atheists kind of talk about, well, the theology doesn't make sense because God would be X, Y, and Z. Well, that's kind of your God. It, it, you acknowledge it's contacted in your head and it doesn't really exist. But that's still something that you have to deal with. I always love it when atheists gauge in theology because many times they just simply come up with notions that go, oh, yeah, that's just not going to work. And it's like you're engaging in theology, you still have a concept of what God could be. And if God was rational to you, this is what a rational God would look like. And yet you don't see that either. If God exists, he would have to conform to that which conforms to reality and would have predictive power in that reality. We'd have to postulate a God that lives in that world and acts in that world. And sometimes even as a deconverted atheist, I find myself thinking like a theist that somehow somebody else is going to come along and rescue us, that somebody else is going to come and save me, that if I'm really having an emotional hard time, that the real thing that I need to do is just trust that somebody's going to come along and help me. And the real hard, cold reality of life is this. Sometimes you do indeed pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, and you do have to go on and soldier on and do what you need to do. And that's just the truth. We need to get over the great contradiction of what we think should be right or think. And for those of you that are Christians, you think that you have this idea of my God in your head that works. I want to let you know, if I take whatever concept you have of your God and you start listening to all the characteristics of God, I can go to the Bible, open it up, 
and show you a passage that contradicts your view of God, and I don't care what it is. I can always find something, 99% of the time at least, I can always find something that contradicts your notion of God. And when you take the big picture of your God and put it next to the Bible, the Bible is going to beat the living crap out of it every time. Because the biblical God is not loving. He's not even all-knowing. And he's not even all-powerful. And that's just the truth. But we'll get to more of that as the series unfolds. In the meantime, I hope that I have, through sharing this video, encouraged you to be a rabid atheist like myself. In the meantime, this is Ed Raby, also known as the Rabbit Atheist, signing off and wishing you a good day.